Welcome everyone. I'm Winking Wong, attorney mediator and founder and president of the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. I am the moderator. Our speakers will speak for about 30 minutes, then take questions. You may start typing now in the uh, Q&A box and you can also upvote the questions that you like. The chat box is off. We are so grateful for our amazing speakers, Dr. Nolan Kagetsu, who is Zooming in from New York City, Dr. Karina Yang, who is Zooming in from Chicago, and I am Zooming in from Los Angeles. Dr. Kagetsu and Dr. Yang will share with us their expertise in mitigating anti-Asian hate and how to be an upstander bystander. Dr. Kagetsu, MD, is MIT class of 1980, SB in chemical engineering. He is a neuroradiologist, associate clinical professor, Department of Diagnostic, Molecular and Interventional Radiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York City. Dr. Kagetsu is a frequent speaker on diversity and inclusion at professional meetings and universities. He has published on mitigating anti-Asian hate, how to be an upstander, microaggression, and mitigating unconscious bias in recruitment and hiring. Dr. Karina Yang, MD, is MIT class of 1999, SB in biology, literature, and chemical engineering. Dr. Yang is an associate professor of radiology at the University of Chicago. She is the director of pediatric Neuroradiology and also director of the Neuroradiology Fellowship. Dr. Yang is interested in simulation training in radiology. She has developed a contrast reaction simulation course and published on the topic. Dr. Yang was a visiting professor in Canada, Hong Kong, India, and Ethiopia. Dr. Yang is also Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion of her department. She co-founded the Chicagoland Radiology Expo, which gives medical students an interactive opportunity to learn about the field, including sessions fostering diversity in the radiology pipeline. The links to their full bios are in the chat. Before we start, let us take a moment to honor those who have been killed and attacked due to anti-Asian hate. We hope that this event will connect, unite, and empower us to mitigate anti-Asian hate and be an upstander. Regardless of race, we are all in this together. I now turn this event over to Dr. Kagetsu. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for the invitation, Wen King. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to thank you for everyone who's uh, attending. I'd, I'd like to start this uh, session off with an exercise I call we uh, they call square breathing. I learned about this from the uh, a session at the fire department of the city of New York uh, and uh, they use it to uh, mitigate stress and uh, sometimes it's useful just to be present and acknowledge we're all present here and um, it's a very simple thing you inhale for um, four counts you hold your breath for four counts and and then you um, exhale for four counts, and then you hold your breath for four counts and inhale. So let's just try that. And uh, I won't actually do it since I'll be talking, but inhale for four counts, inhale, 
two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and inhale. You can try that uh, uh, on your own uh, and it, it may, may reduce stress if some of us are experiencing stress in everyday life. Uh, if anything, when after you hold your breath for four counts here, I'm always grateful for that inhale on that side. And uh, I, I do want to um, start off with a so-called land acknowledgement. Um, I'm here in New York City, so I live on the unceded lands of the Lenape people who belong to the Delaware Nation in Manahata. I'm committed to learn more about and find ways to advocate for the indigenous population of New York City. So acknowledging that, you know, the, what we are going through some um, issues with our group, but the um, indigenous folks have, have their own uh, issues. And, and at some point, I think we need to acknowledge that and, and help them as well. So just a, a brief um, introduction. Uh, what is a bystander and what is an upstander? So I look at as bystander is to upstander as a not racist is to an anti-racist. And this is a book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, that I recommend uh, uh, you, everyone read. And uh, um, a bystander sometimes um, just watches what's going on and the upstander actually tries to do something about it. It's almost the kind of the a same analogy as empathy and compassion, right? Empathy, you feel somebody else's pain, but compassion, you actually try to uh, do something about it and take action and, and to alleviate that pain. So the upstander uh, training that's uh, readily available, uh, some of you on the call may be familiar, but if not, you, all you have to do is Google Hollaback and they have online modules. And I'll just briefly go over kind of their, they call it the five Ds of bystander intervention. And so we'll just go through the five, five steps that they recommend. So the, they, they use a classic New York City example of a subway. And so if somebody, uh, if you witness a, um, a conversation that seems like it's, uh, not, not a friendly conversation, you can do something to distract them. So you can say something like, excuse me, do you know what the next stop is? Some people just say, make noise or sing a random song at the top of your lungs and just everyone will be kind of thinking, oh, that's odd, but at least you've kind of um, stopped the situation. And um, one of the tactics people, um, I was just in a session and they said, you know, carry a whistle and, and, um, and uh, you, you can do that even if you're the victim, you can just blow the whistle and attract attention and that might scare the person away. Delegate, uh, for those of us in the medical field, this is similar to uh, how you do the cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So somebody, um, when they encounter a situation, you take charge and, and you just say, excuse me, this person is being harassed, can you help? So you point to someone and say, you know, can you call 911? And if they seem to understand it then and nod and go do that, then otherwise you find someone else, please call 911 and, and so on and so forth. And, and you kind of give assignments to various people. Can you go get help? Something like that. Uh, so that's delegate. Delay, this is kind of related to distract. Uh, although this and this thing in particular, after the incident is over, you check in with the person who is harassed and just say, are you okay? And what would you like, would you like me to do anything about it? And uh, uh, direct is, is uh, kind of related. You can essentially, uh, depending on the situation, you can actually uh, 
shout something at, at the uh, perpetrator and say, leave them alone. I mean, if you do that, you have to kind of judge, make a judgment because um, that person could turn their wrath on you. So it is always a um, potentially risky, risky thing. And then uh, last of all, the last D is a document. So if you are witnessing something, um, you might take a video that, and then you, um, they, they say here, the only document if the situation is safe. And then they say, after you've done document, like, let's say you've done documenting, then they say, you know what, then after you re check in with the victim, you can say, I took a video, what, what would you like me to do with it? And, you know, you don't just post it on social media, but you check in with the uh, victim and say, you know, what, what would you like to do? I can send it to you and you can send it to the authorities or, or whatever. But yeah, you always ask, ask the person what they want to do. And that's briefly the five Ds of being an upstander. And that's a, really for um, things that are, you know, threatening physical violence, right? So that, that's uh, one way to be an upstander. And, uh, and we, we talked about it. There's an article, you could just Google my name and uh, this article should pop up or um, you can email me or find me on LinkedIn. We can certainly get you that article. And, and basically it talks about uh, the five Ds. And we were upset because you know, the, there are reports of folks in the healthcare that, you know, they are taking care of COVID patients in the hospital and then on their way home, they get harassed and, and uh, Asian American folks are, you know, people are saying, you go, go back to your country. And, and they're like, wow, I'm, I just spent the day in the hospital treating patients. And this is the way we're, we're treated on, on. So, um, I'm going to uh, go to another topic, microaggressions, um, and how we can be upstanders in that situation as well. So microaggression, there's a, a Daryl Sue who has done some work in this area. And the, the term was actually uh, coined initially by an African-American psychiatrist at Harvard, Chester, and I'm, I'm blocking on the, the last name, but, um, and, and it's, it's uh, basically a brief commonplace uh, indignity, uh, whether intentional or unintentional, that um, um, are communicate hostile, derogatory, negative, racial um, uh, insults to the target group or person or group. And uh, I think many of us um, on the panel and probably on the call have experienced these. So this is a video you can uh, actually, I recommend you just Google it and uh, mos microaggressions, mosquito bites, and, and you can watch it and, uh, um, and we'll just go to the next slide. Just what? Okay, so basically if, if you witness a microaggression or experience a microaggression, the op your options are similar to uh, sexual harassment algorithms. So many of us have experience with uh, Title IX um, Title IX issues, or we work in institutions that uh, are, are subject to Title IX, and we've done training. And so your options are either to do nothing, work things out, you either confront the uh, microaggressor and, and, uh, and the person should really listen to the microaggressee, or you can actually, so I call it go to war, and then you essentially report that person to the authorities and refer to your hospital or, or company policy. So there's some considerations. One, do you do nothing? Well, sometimes the history of the interaction with that person is relevant. Uh, so you have to consider the power gradient. Is the other person more powerful than you, less powerful? And then you also have to consider, you know, when what the impact uh, will will be either positive and when you're um, you'll have the most uh, likelihood of having uh, 
a great the greatest positive impact. So you might decide uh, to talk to the person afterwards or um, talk to them in that moment. Uh, you always think of the golden rule. If you committed a, a microaggression, how would you like to be uh, treated? And sometimes you have to consider your personal safety because sometimes a microaggression can escalate to a macroaggression. Um, and you also have to consider your own energy level. Do you really have the energy to deal with this? And, and, uh, um, and so sometimes doing nothing is the best alternative. So um, in the spirit of uh, uh, doing nothing, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg gives this marriage advice in every good marriage. It helps sometimes to be a little deaf. And on the, uh, on, on the other hand, um, Eli Weisel says, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. So these are some things we need to uh, consider. So one way uh, to, to uh, if somebody says something, you can say, wow, that's not cool. And so this happened, uh, uh, you may be familiar with the, the basketball player, Jeremy Lin, and somebody would say something racist and he just says, that's not cool. And uh, you can say things like what you said, maybe feel very uncomfortable. If they make a joke that's not appropriate, you can say, I don't get it, please explain the joke. Or you could just come out and say, I don't actually believe that if they make a, if they make an inappropriate comment. So I, I'll just give a few personal anecdotes and I invite uh, folks to maybe share anecdotes in the chat uh, and perhaps other panelists will uh, talk about some of these, but uh, there was a colleague who actually works in the diversity space. And he said to me, have you been back to Japan? And I, I used it as an educational opportunity. I said, you know, I have been to Japan, but, you know, how do you know I, that you're kind of assuming I came from Japan and I, in fact, was not never, I was not born in Japan. And it kind of uh, is similar to people that say, oh, go back to your own country, right? And it's the so-called perpetual foreigner um, microaggression that no matter how many generations we may have be here, uh, people often assume we're, we're not born in this country. I heard recently somebody use the expression, we wear our, our race on our face. Um, I was at a, of all things, an unconscious bias training session and an African-American colleague used the expression chink in the armor. And uh, I didn't say anything in the moment, but after the, uh, at a break, I, I just noted to him that, you know, it's kind of like um, me using the N-word and, and for, for uh, Asians, it's kind of like the N-word. And there are dictionary words, even though it's a, a figure of speech, I get that it's a figure of speech, it's in the dictionary. There are probably other dictionary words that we should avoid. And he apologized and was appreciative that I, I um, made that point. So, you know, we, one of the things we have to um, acknowledge is we don't wanna paralyze conversation. On the other hand, there is a thing called white fragility. There's a whole book on this topic, how um, some of the, our colleagues are very sensitive and, and uh, get very defensive if they, and, and I, I've had, I heard of colleagues even double, doubling down and saying that, you know, if you think chink in the arm is offensive, you should go educate yourself and, and, and uh, you know, on, on, the, on the use of English. Um, so this is just a quote by Maya Angelou. You, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Um, there are certainly ways to not to respond to feedback. I'm sorry you were offended by what I did. That's a non -apo classic non-apology. Um, often the people with, uh, uh, who, who commit micro intentions, microaggressions, uh, me included, uh, we didn't intend to uh, be, be uh, hurtful or harmful. But we have to acknowledge that there's a difference between intent and, and impact. 
and we have to acknowledge that the impact of our words uh, were not what we intended and, and just uh, acknowledge that and try to do better next time. So here's uh, one response uh, that this person I got, I'm on uh, Twitter and, uh, and this person just said, you know, the best response to any invasive or rude question is why do you ask? And this is in, in response to that whole thing, where are you from, right? In this case, it could be harmless. I heard you grew up in my neighborhood in Queens. If not, it will be obvious and shut down the conversation. And this is just a one, one comment from uh, Dolly Parton um, and talking about impact and, and uh, intent versus impact. And she said, there is such a thing as innocent ignorance and so many of us are guilty of that. When I, and she had a, a restaurant chain called Dixie Stampede. And she said, when they said Dixie was an offensive word, I thought, well, I don't want to offend anybody. This is a business. We'll just call it the Stampede. So that's what they did. As soon as you realize that something is a problem, you should fix it. Don't be a dumbass. That's where my heart is. I would never dream of hurting anybody on purpose. So, you know, they changed the name and moved on and, and acknowledged uh, and that's probably a, a good way to respond to uh, microaggressions. Uh, going to war. Um, so this is a, a physician who um, was kind of annoyed at a med student who um, the surgeon was operating in the meds and he asked the medicine, med student, where are you from? And then the med student essentially reported him to the whatever school administration and this uh, surgeon was banned from working with students. And, uh, you know, it's hard to know the exact contents, but one could argue that that's an overreaction and, and, it's, uh, and it's not gonna help, help situations. So I, uh, I just, a few other kind of random things. Uh, um, in the evaluation uh, sphere, I heard about um, somebody said, oh yeah, one of the residents barely speaks English. And in retrospect, it was probably a, a resident that had a Chinese accent and they just, um, so I, I thought that was not appropriate. Um, and then what, one other thing is that it's important to um, check in with folks and this happens you know, we can check in with our African-American colleagues after a crazy incident happens. And this is how an African-American colleague um, checked in on me after the uh, shooting in Atlanta. She said, I've been checking in on my folks. Let me know how you're doing. Also, feel free to not want to talk about it. Just want to wish you well and good spirits. And sometimes, you know, some people are hesitant about checking in because you don't want to just check in and, and um, bother somebody, but this person recognized that, you know, she, she says, it's okay if you don't want to respond um, and uh, just wanted to let you know, I'm thinking of you. And I think we should do that sort of thing more often. And that's being an ally slash upstander. So uh, thank you. I thought those are all my prepared slides and I'm uh, ready to go for a, for a, um, a panel. I, uh, this is my uh, uh, email, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, so uh, be happy to uh, connect with you all later. Thank you so much, Dr. Kagetsu. A great presentation. And Dr. Yang? Yes. Any comment on that? Um, I think there's a lot of good tips and material in there. Um, I think walking that fine line between bystander and upstander is probably a very challenging situation for everyone. Um, I think I'm still, you know, figuring out how to navigate it myself. I think Dr. Kagetsu's um, very uh, spot on about, it depends on the situation. And I think that's where it comes in, where, you know, you have to sort of assess the situation and, and figure out how much risk you want to take in terms of doing some of the um, steps in terms of, of becoming an upstander. Um, but I think they're, they're really great tips and, and easy to remember with the mnemonic for some of them. And I, I think we can all take that um, to heart and, and try to remember that um, in situations that we find ourselves in. 
I remember that you mentioned in your case, um, you make sure that people call you Dr. Yang. Yes, and that's actually, it's funny because personally I'm very casual as I've mentioned to both of you. Um, in the realm of medicine, um, females are often misaddressed or underaddressed. Um, they, various people, even interprofessional between different colleagues and um, from nurses and techs, um, especially we're in radiology, so we work with a lot of nurses and techs. Um, there's a difference that has been found um, where male colleagues or male physicians are um, called by doctor and their last name, and females more often are called by their first name. Um, and it's not something that really occurred to me at first, because as I said, I'm very casual, but the more senior I got, I realized that it, it does happen. And I see a lot of my friends posting about it and it really bothers them. Um, and so it is something that I think a lot of female physicians face, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, even from a letter being written to them from their, you know, from a professional society, sometimes they, they mess up and, and use the wrong name. It's very interesting how often it occurs. So it is something that I think female physicians are, are quite sensitive about. Right. Are there other situations that I remember you mentioned that you went to a wedding recently yes. with your family? Yes. So it was my um, prior nanny who we're still very close with. Um, we attended her wedding on the East Coast and I'm married to uh, another MIT alum, a couple years uh, um, older than me. And we have two little girls, they're eight and 10. And we went to an East Coast wedding in Vermont. Um, and at the wedding, um, which is pretty much all Caucasian, I think we were the only Asians there. And because of this close relationship we have with our prior nanny, um, so it was a relatively probably not very diverse wedding. Um, and we met um, my uh, prior nanny's cousin who I had heard of, heard about through my nanny. And she came up to us and, and I was with my daughters and she made a comment about, um, oh, this must be the, um, you know, have, have, have your children ever attended uh, a non-Chinese wedding? And it literally took me a couple seconds to register what she was asking because I have never been asked something like that. And then I quickly realized she she thinks number one we're either, you know, stayed in China for a while or or only attend Chinese weddings. I wasn't really sure exactly what it was, but it, like I like Dr. Kugetsu was referring to in his talk, I, I used that as an opportunity for education. I knew she didn't, you know, her intention was not malicious. It was just she's not familiar. I think she's very local. She doesn't really travel much, so she's in Vermont area. And I I let her know that you know we we actually travel all around the world. My children have actually only attended one other wedding. It was my brother in law's, um, um, and we are Chinese, but. Um, it was a very diverse wedding and they've actually, you know, not never attended a Chinese wedding in terms of a traditional Chinese ceremony. So I took it as an opportunity to educate. Wow, that's great. And Dr. Yang and Dr. Kagetsu, you guys are frontline medical workers. So how do you balance the paradox that you're trying to save life, help people, but at the same time, you're dealing with anti-Asian hate. For example, Dr. Kagetsu, you're from New York City, which is the epicenter for COVID-19 for a long time. And now the anti-Asian hate. How do you cope mentally and physically? Because discrimination and traumas do affect our mental and physical health? So, uh, a couple things. I, I'm, uh, I'm a radiologist, so I'm not necessarily uh, front, front line and see patients every day. I mean, I, maybe in the last year, I actually did one procedure on a patient relatively recently after the vaccine. So I, I um, didn't have my, uh, uh, put my life on the line uh, like some of my colleagues. And, and, and in fact, there are two of our, my colleagues in radiology died. So it was a very, it was very kind of uh, bizarre to go to Zoom memorial services, Zoom grief counseling, and, and uh, that, that's a, a long, long story. Uh, and uh, well, actually three, three colleagues died. And, and uh, you know, I, I tried to do my part by doing what I can. I was kind of a, a advocate of wearing masks relatively early on and 
trying to get people to listen to wear masks. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually took, have taken mindfulness based stress reduction. So that helps as well. Um, and, uh, read, read, uh, I've been doing some reading within my spare time, reading about the Stoics and their approach to, uh, their, the plagues and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, I, I think that that is, uh, help, helpful. Uh, how about you, Dr. Yang? So same, I'm in the same field as Dr. Pickett, who, so, um, again, not truly, truly on the front lines, um, but I have a lot of colleagues who are, and I've heard about, you know, their, um, their stress and, you know, dealing with um, the pandemic and working um, on the front lines. And I think um, for myself, just hearing about the stories is, is very stressful already. And um, I think for myself, I was not um, very good at mindfulness before I'm trying to get better. So I definitely started doing more, um, uh, taking up opportunities that the university was actually providing pretty much on a daily basis. Yeah, the university did a great job. I'm sure many of them did. Um, and they, they had sessions at, in the beginning, probably daily. And I, I did do them um, every day because for a while, radiology was actually slow because everyone was shut down and at home, no one was getting imaging. So for Dr. Kagetsu and I, we actually had a little, probably an opposite paradox effect of, of not having um, as much work for, for a short period of time. And so I actually took advantage of that time to try to learn um, some mindfulness techniques and, and just to speak with my you know, friends and family and colleagues um, about their experiences. Um, and you know, I think communicating is probably the best remedy in, in, in these situations. Yeah, especially for Dr. Yang, during the anti-Asian hate that um, women are especially targeted, how do you, cope with that? Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit daunting. Um, definitely the Atlanta um, shooting was very jarring. Um, you know, and, and I think the, the news articles that came out shortly after where um, the main officer, right, he was saying that this is not a racist, right? Um, right? That was the initial sort of statement. Um, that was even more disturbing to hear that, but ultimately, you know, for the women that are, um, that were, um, um, that died and, and their male colleagues, uh, male, um, associates as well. I think that, um, sort of line of saying that this is not a racist, you know, uh, motivation by the shooter was very discouraging. Um, and, um, you know, to get your head around that was pretty challenging. I think um, in that instance, um, reading up on other um, opinions that were offered and how that, um, especially those females um, working at the salon in that line of work, sort of making a lot of stereotypes were made, I think as well uh, against them um, as to why they, they were the ones chosen and um, throwing it back to that ultimately this is, you know, um, uh, an issue of misogyny that you know was sort of right. overlooked uh, or, or under under described, and so I think boiling that back down to remember you know what this violent episode was about um, is really important um, in terms of coping. I mean, it definitely made us all more nervous. Um, especially, you heard later on a lot of older um, elderly Asians were. Um, the subject um, of the violence, um, some of them women, some of them men. Um, and we all have, you know, friends or, you know, for myself, my parents are pretty aged now um, and, and they're not very strong. And to think that they might get injured was very frightening. I did have a colleague who had, I think, um, an aunt or an uncle, um, not in Chicago. There actually has not been, uh, knock on wood, some much uh, straight violence out against anti against Asians in Chicago. Um, they've just written an article about that recently. I'm not really sure why that is. Um, you know, it's it's been fortunate, but it, it does happen um, to relatives of colleagues, um, and to hear about that is is very frightening. Um, and I think again, sharing um, these episodes with each other um, is important um, to to learn from the experiences. Thank you. I'm seeing two questions here in the Q&A. And the first one is directed to Dr. Yang from Alicia Ouyang. And her question is, Dr. Yang's experience 
makes me think about how there are so many axes of being a minority that you can experience microaggression as from being uh, BIPOC, female, LGBTQIA, etc. Do you have any tips on how to be resilient with the stress of the different axes of vulnerability? Sure. So, I mean, in my instance, of course, female, Asian, um, in medicine, in a field that Dr. Kagetsu and I are in that we may have not raised yet, but in a field where there's actually very few women, it's like less than 25% in radiology, actually. Um, and that's been for over two decades. It's, it's been very low and not because it's not a great field. It's actually a wonderful field for women, but there's a lot of misconceptions and, and such. Um, so I definitely have felt some, I, I, I think I've been lucky, I've not felt a, a lot um, in the field that I'm in but by being Asian and by being female. I think um, I've had instances where, um, especially now, because I'm trying to attain more leadership positions where um, there have been microaggressions against me, or um, I think there's a stereotype that I'm an Asian female, so I should be quiet. I should not make noise. I should not you know, make any waves. And when I, I I'm not like that. I'm pretty vocal as a, as an Asian female. And I like to see things get done. I like to see things change. I like to do things. So when I make suggestions as to how things can change, I have had thrown back at me, like, why are you making all these complaints? And they're not complaints, even that better myself. These are real problems, you know, in our department that affect other people that actually have nothing to do with me, but I raised them out of the goodness of my heart. And I actually got back why did you complain? You're making more work for me. So that was, that's hard. Um, so in terms of how to deal with that or, or how to be resilient, um, ultimately I, I just sort of, you know, put my heart in the issue. Like, what am I trying to fix? Who am I trying to better in this situation? And, you know, I sort of don't let that distract me um, because I know that that maybe is coming from a stereotype that they think, or maybe they think I'm being too vocal. I'm not sure, but um, it, it is a, a tough line sometimes. As Dr. Kagetsu mentioned, it depends on the, the relative power level. So if I'm speaking with someone that is my leader or senior, it, it can be a little bit dicey, um, but to try to stay strong and um, not let those um, things get to me and, and keep going with whatever I'm trying to do. So how do you respond if they say, why are you complaining? You're creating more work for me. Or they like to say, you're a troublemaker, right? Right. You heard of that. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I At basically, least. yeah. I said, you know, that these are not even um, issues that have anything to do with me. I'm trying to make our department stronger. Maybe put it back on them that you're trying to create a, a better department or a better section, whatever you're striving for. Um, take it away so that it's not personal, I think helps um, because you're trying to better a group or you're trying to make a situation better. I think to deflect it and um, to show them that you're there to try to make change or um, to want to better something that um, you're willing to stand up for it. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter if, if you don't like the fact that I, you know, made some noise and, and made a complaint, so. Great. And Dr. Kagetsu, there's another question for you. How do you feel uh, being held up as a stereotypical model minority? Have you experienced this at your work in addition to outside of work? So yeah, that's a wonderful question and that could be a subject of a one hour uh, uh, meeting and I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, I actually had the opportunity to look at whenever they talk about model minority myth, they talk about this New York, uh, time, New York Times magazine or something article. Uh, if you Google uh, and, and they talk about in the 1960s, they were actually talking about me. And, and so in 1966, I was like a seven year old and they actually started off with the Japanese American experience that you know the people that were in the internment camps and now look how they're doing relatively they're relatively successful and they contrasted the japanese american experience with so-called problem minorities and so of course you know my mom ate it up she was like yes we're we're the model minority but then 
it turned more ominous because, and then at some point they added other uh, Chinese Americans to that. And then, and then now South Asians are, are, you know, quote the model minority. And in part, it's part, in part because of the um, immigration uh, laws that only allowed people with education and stuff like that to come into the country. And so they kind of had a, 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 a jump on the existing popula minority populations. And, and it's been actually, there's uh, the expression model minority myth. So model minority myth is that, you know, people are using the model minority stereotype as a wedge between the different racial subgroups. And so uh, whenever they uh, flatter us, we actually have to say, no, no, no. I, and, and there's actually a hashtag, not your wedge, model minority myth, I'm not going to be your wedge to separate people. And that even carries over into the whole thing with so-called affirmative action. And they're using the Asians, uh, I think, as a wedge for at, at Harvard to try to do away with affirmative action. And uh, so, um, but, and, and so the, one of the things with the uh, the quote problem minorities, they say, look, the Japanese Americans did it without all these welfare programs and the government assistance. And, and what is it uh, that's, you know, special about this group? And they tried to say, oh, maybe it's their family values or, or this and that. But, but the bottom line is that it tries to ignore the systemic racism that, um, you know, hundreds of years of systemic racism that um, responsible for, for, uh, um, other groups, and then even even now they're they're trying to um, kind of um, you know, a lot of the videos show African Americans um, um, being violent against the Asian elders, right? And and even if they're I, I was on the other webinar, so even if that is true, it's still inflammatory, and um, we shouldn't let that be a wedge between the different racial groups. I was actually on an Instagram live with uh, some uh, African-American physicians and we were talking about solidarity, right? I think shortly after the Atlanta shootings. And I, I think it, uh, we it, just like many of the Asian groups, like back in the day, the, you know, the Japanese were fighting the Chinese and, and now we have to be, ha show solidarity and we have to show solidarity with the African-American and other minority communities as well. Um, so. Thank you. And the, um, next question, the next question would be relevant to uh, Dr. Yang and myself because we're women and we're smaller in size. So Humphrey Chen asked, for him, it's easier for him to be an upstander because he's six feet three. But what about people who end up thinking that they're bigger and more threatening than they really are? What advice would you share with someone who wants to be upstander but doesn't have the physical presence to do so safely? The whistle is a good idea. Any other ideas? I was actually just on a security um, kind of, uh, or on a conference call with a security uh, guy from New York City, and he he suggested, you know, we have this app uh, for a so-called buddy system, and so you, if to the extent you can travel with somebody else, uh, travel uh, avoid the. In New York City, we have a lot of um, kind of covered underpass, and avoid those places where you're, you know, people can't see you. And there's strategies like, you know, in the subway station, it, there's little signs saying what time the train is coming three minutes away, five minutes away. So stay by the booth until the last minute before you go to the platform. So that you're kind of and then he says the booth, even if there's no one in the booth, there's cameras in the booth. And the, the bad guys know that so they they're not, I mean, some bad guys know that, and so they won't commit an, uh, a crime near a, even an unmanned booth. So that's a New York City uh, pro tip. And uh, yeah, to the extent you can travel together and uh, 
um, they actually, one of the security guards said that, you know, this pepper spray is not um, often that gets used against the person that has the pepper spray. They just grab it out of your hand and use it on you while you're kind of fumbling around for it. So they don't recommend pepper spray. Um, and the whistle seems like a good thing that's fast. And even these kind of little push button alarm things, I worry that, you know, when you want it the most, the battery will be out or, or some crazy thing. And the, a whistle is pretty low tech. And even though we went to MIT, I like a, that low tech uh, solution. So that was something that, that I heard from security professionals. But it, I mean, if, oh, and then the medical student at our place that was attacked, she actually uh, was pushed to the ground and uh, she had studied Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, oh, okay. and so, you know, martial arts is a classic way for a smaller person to uh, subdue a, a bigger person. But she said she did some sort of foot sweep and that may have helped have the guy run away as opposed to causing more harm. So she, she was knocked to the ground, he stole her phone, but she did some sort of foot sweep and from her Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class. So it could have been worse, I, I suppose, but um, yeah, it, it is certainly a challenge. Yes. And this is coming from a parent, Gary Hong. Um, he asked a large percentage of the attacks, oh no, Yiso. Uh, many of my friends, age in the mid 50s and often from large US cities have a difficult time convincing our kids, recent college grads or still in college to be more vigilant. Any advice? Do you have that problem too? I mean, I, I have, uh, actually my uh, daughter is telling me to be more vigilant and carry a stick when I go outside. Um, but um, one daughter has experienced just kind of verbal harassment and uh, obscene gestures. And uh, somebody said, it's all because of you. And she kind of, it took her uh, a second to realize that. So um, they, they, uh, they get it that, you know, it's a real, real problem. And uh, maybe it's when those stories spread enough, then people will say, you know, it, it's for real. Yeah, how about you, Dr. Yang? How do you talk to your kids about yeah. their place here? Yeah, so my kids are a lot younger, um, nowhere near college yet, um, eight and 10 years old. Um, they uh, are perhaps a little bit sheltered. They do attend a private school that's associated with University of Chicago. It's a very diverse school. So they're they've attended it since they were three years old. So they have um, quite a, um, a different outlook, let's say on life. At the same time, my husband and I are not very protective in terms of the news. I know some parents for children that age do not tell their children everything that's going on. We have CNN on, um, we, we pretty much show them anything and everything. We, we really don't hide anything from them. So they are aware of the daily news and, and when the, um, uh, uh, various episodes of violence have occurred. They've seen that we've taken them to a Black Lives Matters protest that was in downtown. Um, you know, we, we stayed behind the lines, but just for them to sort of see what was going on for them to understand. So I feel, you know, a lot of what the school has already done, you know, to help us um, tell them and explain to them is really great because they set a foundation. Um, they get the conversation going at a, a, an appropriate level for children because I by no means am in a expert in that. Um, they've taken the children to Brianna Taylor. Um, there's a little memorial for her near the school and, and it's been actually torn down slash vandalized more than once. I don't know by who. Um, and so they've actually taken the children back. So maybe some people would opt not to because it's their artwork and their signs that they made and it was all torn down and spray painted, but they actually brought them back to show them the effects. So I think when you show children that age and confront them with these real things that are going on, um, you know, to the appropriate degree, I don't give them all the details of the Atlanta shootings, but um, when, they're, when they're seeing that, you know, almost daily at this point, or, you know, at, at some point it was daily, they have questions. They ask me questions. They ask my husband questions. And we just tell them, you know, 
you're safe with us, but these real things happen. And um, I want you to be, you know, careful and be vigilant and, you know, um, you know, learn from these experiences, not experiences, but learn from these incidents um, and listen to your teachers and, and what they're trying to teach you and, and to explain to them sort of why these things are happening. I, th I think that's probably the most important point. Um, but they're still a bit young, so we haven't done too much in terms of truly how to to handle a, a situation if it actually occurred to them. And I, I don't think they've encountered any, even at their grade level. Um, there have been things that have happened in the school, but at the older level. So we get emails about some of the older students having said this or that, but it has not come directly to my children yet. Okay. Here's another question from a parent about children and the next generation from Linda Chang. And she said, I think it is true that on average, Asian Americans are not as assertive as they should be. Please comment on how we can help the next generation and ourselves to learn to answer microaggression in the manner that Dr. Kagetsu suggested. I found them very helpful and reasonable, but I can't say that I'll come up with them in the moment. Yet, is this instant response that would be the most helpful? I have uh, two comments, and and uh, I think uh, you could argue it, it starts at the dinner table. And so sometimes uh, parents expect the children to be quiet at the dinner table. And uh, and some families, it, they are expected to debate. And I think uh, the more we... Uh, and, and so, you know, it, we, if we expect our children just to be very obedient to the uh, parents um, or, or not talk back or not question what we say, then surprise, surprise, they're going to, that's their survival MO. And, and I, I think that's, that could be, and, you know, that's probably the way many of us were raised that, you know, you never question father or whatever, or the elders. And so to the extent we can kind of change that, I think that would help uh, setting the norms for, for the kids. Um, and then the instant response is, a, that, that's a classic uh, thing. Um, I, I've just heard a, 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 a French expression for it, something about escalier, you, you're in the party and then you think of the uh, witty response on your way out down as you're going down the stairs leaving the party and so that's kind of uh we we've all done that and and uh but i think so in some ways you have to almost practice or rehearse uh and the more you you do it the more you have a, a fresh uh, answer and and, and um, the more practice you have the more you'll remember the the responses um in line with the practice discussion, um, even though I've done work in radiology and simulation, um, my plan is to actually um, develop a simulation for um, diversity related topics. So this would actually, you know, be one of obviously one of the um, topics or, or themes that we, we could do, um, because I think Dr. Kagetsu is right, it's, it's practice. It, anything you practice is gonna be a little bit easier when you face it. It'll still be stressful, it'll still be hard, but having the opportunity to practice, right now I do contrast reactions when people get a, um, a different symptoms when they get some contrast in them, but you carry that forward to um, um, a, a situation where you are receiving a microaggression um, or you're in a search committee setting and, and someone says something about a candidate, how would you respond? Um, you know, and, and really just giving examples and providing that in a simulated setting and then having the opportunity after the simulation to debrief. It's not just about practicing, it's about actually going back in the safe space of simulation and learning um, what could have been done better, what was great, but what could have been done better. So that's my plan. <laughs> when I have more time, I plan on developing this program, but it hasn't happened yet, hopefully this upcoming year. That's a great idea. I like that. And also I'm finding that even though people say to me, they are burnt out on anti-Asian hate webinars and all that, but sitting through this and talking to all of you and other speakers too, I get to practice too because they are telling me about different situations and how they react. 
and also talking to friends and finding what happened to them. And we have a chance, like you say, to debrief and to practice because they also have a chance later on to think of the right response, you know. Yeah. Then you're kind of learning vicariously and you know, practicing and hopefully when it happens, you can react. I have the same problem, you know, when things happen at that moment, I may not have a response or I may not pick up the nuances, you know, and then later realize, oh, that's an insult or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So no matter, no matter how many webinars that you feel you're burnt out on, maybe it's a good idea to sit through them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also learn more about myself mm-hmm. just by talking to all of you. Thank you. And I remember the previous speaker, uh, Dominic Ying, who's a former um, San Francisco police captain. And like Dr. Kagesu, he said that some Asian parents train their children not to look at an aggressor and not to respond. So if something happened, they can't describe how the aggressor, who the perpetrator is, how they look like. And, some, and then they can protect themselves because they don't see the attack coming because they're not looking. They're looking at the ground and then become what he called the perfect victim and the perfect target. Oh, I see another question uh, from an alum. I believe she's a radiologist too. Uh, Priscilla Song Sanders. Oh. And she said, it is my understanding that attacks on Asian Americans are proportionately more likely to be committed by African Americans and that FBI statistics bear this out. Do you feel that the media sweeps this under the rug because Asians are lower on the intersectionality ladder? Have you seen the African American community calling out these bad eggs? or rally around the Asian American community in these instances? I, I can uh, uh, comment on that. Um, I think from, you know, I saw some article and, and they were trying to make the point that um, it was actually more white than African American, but I kind of trust the last speaker from San Francisco Police Department that said 85% were African American on Asian American. But I think publicizing that is not productive because it's just going to create more animosity. And, and, uh, and, and in fact, he said they contacted the gangs to say, you know, don't cause a race war. Because, you know, we, and, and that's, it's just not going to help. And, and in some ways, that's the whole thing. The, the um, minorities, I mean, that's what a, a white supremacist might like is the minorities fighting each other, right? That was the whole thing with the Korea riots in the LA, right? The, the, it was the African-Americans and, and the Asians fighting and that was what made the news and, and, uh, and the two groups essentially lost. Uh, and so I think it's kind of analogous even to me, like it's unproductive to try to all this press about did the COVID come from a lab? I mean, if it, if they decide it did, all it's going to do is create more hate against the AAPI. And so even talking about that issue to me is not productive. And in fact, I've been to some uh, conferences and they'll say, you know, likely they'll never figure it out because if, if it was from a lab, they've, they're not going to admit it. And, and, uh, and so, but it's just not, not a productive conversation because it's just going to result in more violence. So I would, and then of course, I would like to have uh, African-American uh, community uh, be more vocal. I mean, I, I, we did have, um, uh, we did have uh, uh, um, this this uh, uh, Instagram live with uh, African American physicians, and we were trying to show solidarity. And then one of the earlier uh, questions about mental health issues, um, 
and the medical profession's response, that kind of speaks to this whole thing about social determinants of health, where, you know, physicians can, radiologists can only do so much, but so many of the health issues are socioeconomic. So much of socioeconomic is from so-called systemic racism. And I think that's an important point to make. Um, I don't know if of the 44 participants, uh, I, my daughter, I didn't learn about this at MIT. I learned about it from my daughter who was a sociology major. She says, um, you, all the panelists, everyone, participants, we could be uh, perfectly morally fine people, but just because we uh, live life in, in, and the, the system is essentially rigged against African-Americans, whether it's the Jim Crow, and, and for example, one of the perpetrators of a, a, attacks, he was recently released from prison, African-American, and, but, you know, African-Americans are, disproportionately put in prison and why is that and it and then you could say it goes to the war on drugs and the war on drugs some people say is almost like a war on african americans and so that's why some people are hesitant to say more policing and you know policing has its issues and and so policing is not necessarily the answer so to the extent um physicians can influence the social determinants of health um, and and uh, kind of the what are the root causes of mental illness? I, I remember uh, somebody was commenting, "Well, what about the gangs?" And then you kind of have to say, "Well, why are there gangs?" Right? It's like you know uh, George Bush would say, "Oh, the root cause of terrorism is terrorists." And you know, why are there terrorists? It's because you know somebody bombed and killed their families, and uh, and they made it their life mission to seek revenge on the United States, right? And and uh, we, and, uh, you know, we, we send, you know, how many drones did we send out in the, the last month? Anyways, oh, time's up. Yeah, because Dr. Yang has another meeting to attend. So, Dr. Yang, you need to leave now? Yes, yes. Um, I think I would just <laughs> offer a last, um, you know, plea that I hope that, you know, as Dr. Kagetsu mentioned, the, the solution, I think, to this is, unity. Um, and the more we speak with our friends, family, and colleagues um, about it and um, communicate, I think that's really the solution. Um, there's a quote from uh, James Baldwin, who's a poet, essayist, uh, novelist, and he said, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So in terms of being a bystander, upstander, I think that really speaks to, um, you know, um, putting yourself up there if it's a safe place to do so um, and bringing that um, to the forefront to help others if we're confronted with situations like that. Thank you. And Dr. Kagesu, any last word? Uh, yes, um, to the extent all of us have privilege, you know, we went to MIT and, and so that we have privilege and uh, we, we have to use our privilege to help those with less privilege. So kind of a very similar to what Dr. Yang says. Right. Thank so thank you, so thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much to both of you, Dr. Kagetsu and Dr. Yang. And thank you everyone. We hope that you find this webinar helpful. We will produce more free public webinars and events to advance all of us and our community. For the MIT community, please join the MIT Chinese Alumni Group for the public, please connect with me on LinkedIn and send your feedback and your email address if you wish to be added to our email invite list. My link is in the chat. The recording of this event will be posted on the MIT Alumni Association's YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you and goodbye.